Excellent. Okay, with that, uh, Tim, how about I'll kick things off by simply saying welcome to the weekly briefing. This is the moment every week when RevThink and the community of owners uh, that run studios and production companies, we get together and we compare notes and we hear from someone in the industry who has their finger on the pulse. Saul, no pressure. Um, Tim, not <laughs> How do I spotlight it's you? It's a corpse. It's, it's a corpse. Being around the right. All right. I'm going to, I can't seem, you can't, uh, you're going to have to spotlight me and you and Saul. I don't know what's going on with my, sure. my sentence here. But um, our guest today uh, is Saul Friedman. I'm going to um, step into the background and let Tim run the show because Tim, this is really kind of your world with everything you've been doing with Show Launcher and very excited for you to welcome Saul and introduce him. So I'll let you take it away. That sounds great. Um, I'm messing around with spotlights right now, and uh, there we go. There we hey, go. Hey, Saul, it's good. Thanks for joining us. I I want to say originally we met you through Neil Berkeley, right? That was That's the introduction. Right. Oh yeah, so great. Um, what I probably what the the overall like arc of our conversation be or the bridge of the conversation is Neil's story a little bit of somebody that had owned a production company for many years really as a service-based business, uh, worked for, you know, broadcast companies, what have you, and eventually got himself into making content. Um, and he had his own journey. Um, so when he introduced us, that collaboration of, hey, the things that you and I like to talk about, about show launcher and what you do for a living, and really kind of like get into the meat of what it takes to make content. It's, um, it's a great conversation. So thanks for being part of it today. I'm happy to be here. Um, let, before we get started too much, why don't you just introduce yourself to everyone, tell them why we should believe you and all that kind of stuff. And then I have a, a big question to ask you. Hello, everybody. I'm going to start with why you should believe me before I tell you who I am. Don't believe me. Take everything <laughs> I say. Honestly, take everything I say and anybody else says with a grain of salt and the stuff that you think works for you. Hang on to it. There's certain experiential nuggets that are somehow universal truths, but the the the... the if, if you are watching this pre-taped and, and you need to go somewhere, the headline is, you know, um, there's really no mathematical equation to, to getting into content <laughs> sales and development. It's I know you're introducing like, yourself, but I'm going to just totally agree with you at that moment because I was watching South Park recently and I just was reminded of how simple of a start they had and they keep on going and going and going. So, yeah, there yeah. is no formula, is there? Because that's absurd how some people really break in. It's really true. So, um, hi, I'm Saul. Uh, I have been working in non-scripted TV for 17, 18 years now. Uh, I, I, um, I'm not a huge fan of physical production. What I do and where my area of expertise is, is from ideation to pilot delivery. So come up with the idea, develop the idea, package the idea, pitch the idea, sell the idea. Uh, package showrunners into it if we need to become the liaison between the network and production, make sure that the show that was sold is the show that gets delivered because that often does not necessarily happen. And then I am a high volume business, so I can't afford to dedicate too much time to season one, two, three, and four. So once we know the show's in good hands, I step back and I go back to my many other projects and it's a, a rinse and repeat. I've worked with some of the bigger companies uh, over the last decade and a half and a couple of years ago, I launched my own company. Um, and that's, how's that for the intro? Should I, should yeah, I you know, going? it's really good because in a way I could hear right away what makes you different from the majority of our current listeners. And the idea of what you, you do this for a living, you, you develop, you well, ideate, develop and get on air TV shows for a living. And, and a lot of us have this idea of like, well, I do something else for a living, but I do have some things, some ideas that I want to get on air. Yeah. Um, so we want to really just know like, what does it take? So I can take my idea, my one great idea and sell it so that, you know, that life calling I've had and this thing I've been holding on to can finally do the thing it's supposed to do. And my mom would be proud of me. Right. That's, that's some of what we all kind of desire in this from this conversation is what Saul so give us the secret out there of what's going on. But someone that does it every day of their life, you're hopefully you're going to tell us like there's a little bit different of what it actually means to 
to yeah. get a show from an idea to sold? Because I'm going to guess you have a lot of ideas that have not been sold. Oh, yeah. Well, you and I have talked prior to this about my, I, I, it could almost be my wall of shame, just projects that didn't sell, but I keep them on my whiteboard behind this computer because you never know. There's a, a game show that I, I just delivered Fox, uh, oh, didn't deliver, shot for Fox last week. That was a decade in the making and, and it, some things take time. Um, it's a really tough question to answer in the time that we have, but I would say key things, watch TV. A lot of people have a great idea in a vacuum and they have no idea that show's already been on air. That show, elements of that show have, have been in other shows. And so what you've brought to the table has already been exploited in some way and without elevating it further, you're kind of dead in the water. This is a great Netflix idea is meaningless if you don't have an understanding as to what Netflix has been doing in their rear view mirror and what they are looking at there uh, and through the windshield of what's ahead. So watch TV to understand the buyers, understand where your good idea is going to go. I have a game show uh, that I'm developing right now that I, I was talking to UTA about and I had to pump the brakes on it because I told them, I love this, I'm not sure who's gonna buy it. And I'll just tell you what it is because I don't know if I'll ever do anything with it. It's something I'm internally calling skin it to win it. It's sort of a minute to win it meets double dare type of a game show. Sure. Oh, I'm seeing some faces I know pop up. And, uh, but the difference is it's almost like strip poker. If you can't, if you can't compete the physical challenge, you can get another chance, but it's going to cost you an article of clothing. So it's a bit of a social experiment. How That's far are you awesome. going to go before you drop out of the game? It's, it's a cool idea. I don't know who will ever buy it. So I'm like, look, I got a million other ideas with more buyers. Maybe I don't like them as much, but they're more buyers. So what is your idea? Why does it need to exist? How's it differentiating your um, point of view in the marketplace? And why is it coming from you? Who are the logical buyers for it? And are there any comparisons out there? And then are there any strategic attachments you can make to something to make a great idea an undeniable idea? Give it that sexy press release. So, it's um, so, so, so it's like the way you're talking sounds similar to the kind of the reverse engineering that I talked about in Show Launcher too, where because the word you kept using is this idea of buyer that there's actually a market and the thought that you have something in any market just because you own it, right? My, my, like I have this great collection of something, but if I take it to the wrong flea market, it's not going to sell. It just doesn't sell right and in thinking about content really is this thought of like well there are consumers of this stuff right and so you should understand what those consumers want as you make those ideas and put them out there so if you do have this is why i keep saying, emphasizing this idea of one idea if you have one idea it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a buyer for it you that's have, right in the content game you're really starting with just maybe where I even think why, like why even make the show? What's the purpose of it? Who is that relevant for? Where do those people exist? And then what the show can be. And my best example is the My Pillow guy. Like that's that's a lot of content that was on TV. Clearly there was a market and a distribution channel for it. And if it and if it didn't make money or if it didn't make sense, he wouldn't have been on television over and over and over again. Right. So their content itself, you have to understand how that market plays itself out. Um, but I, here's the, here's what I, I believe a lot of us think though, is that we watch TV, we're consumers of it. And so we know what we'd like, therefore we think the world needs more of that. So if I really love, um, this, this show that I watch about a chess player and they're, you know, always beating the Russians. If I like that show, then I say, we should have more shows about chess. And the reality is, is that there might be a show at one time that really hit the marketplace, but it doesn't mean there's the market still available for that. Well, um, that's a very literal that. translation of what you're seeing to what you're selling. And I would say, take a step back from being that literal. You're seeing a show about the uh, chess girl and she's beating the Russians. You're looking at an underdog story. You're looking at, um, sports adjacent storytelling you're looking at international dynamics at play 
I would say, don't look at the plate and say, I want to order another one of those. Go in the kitchen and look at all the ingredients that made the plate and think, how can I reinvent a brand new dish that services that same thing? So I want to go back to what you said when I keep talking about the buyer. And yes, I do. And I actually do mean specific executives and certain chairs, but like in, in politics, they're the senators and the congressmen representing their constituents and the we TV network and buyer is a very different audience than Paramount Plus. So when I, and I forgive me, I'm using my own little internal shorthand, but when I'm talking about buyer, I mean eyeballs too. Yes, I, the temperament of the buyer, the personality of the buyer, I, I'm pretty universally me, but I do, I think we all adapt our personalities to who we're talking to. And that will happen based off the personality of the buyer. So too does the creative shift and pivot somewhat based off of the network. Sure. There are formats that I will take out that I hope they're big international primetime game shows. But if I can also sell them as a cable show with a small pivot, if I could also make it a kid's show with a small pivot, if I could also make it a family show with a small pivot, I'm going to exploit that too, because there's only so much time and money I can put into any given project. So if I could turn four buyers into eight buyers, suddenly it's worth my time to really focus on that one and not my strip game show, which has maybe one buyer. <laughs> yeah, like a small market. All right, so let's back up and, and um, just think of like the very beginning of an idea, right? Yeah. Um, if, you're, if you really want to get into the content space, um is that you know wh where do we start do we just start with ideas do we whiteboard it um, um so this is where this is a tough i think personal is i i'm my creative is very personal to me and the things that i bring out typically the the buyers get excited about my ideas not because i'm show running them i don't but because i have a very particular taste and take and they always know saul's got to bring us something a little bit out of left field um so you have my, a, you have buyers that know you already you're like a curator yeah, of them. yeah yeah but that i guess you could say that's my brand whatever that means sure. so i would say before you even look at the idea or the buyer look inward who are you I've done consulting with companies that are very millennial or really Gen Z focused in their tone and brand, and they have a Real Housewives type of a show. It's like, why is that coming from you? You should be thinking about all of the youth oriented platforms and buyers. And it just, it's confusing. Buna sure. Murray, for example, exceptional in celebrity docu. They, the celebrities trust them after the Kardashians and the Simple Life and uh, all the WWE shows, celebrities trust them to protect them, their brand and their messaging. And the audience trusts them to tell an honest, compelling story that does not feel like it's fabricated storytelling. Pilgrim Films and Television, another place that I worked, people know them as very male skewing aggro stuff. If suddenly they flip flopped and Buna Murray came out with a beards and bellies kind of history channel, discovery channel show, it could sell, but it would be a bigger talk and consideration. And if all of a sudden Craig Pelagian and Pilgrim was going out with, you know, a show about TikTokers, wait, that, that feels very off brand. So look inwards, understand your brand. And it doesn't matter if you're a motion graphics company, if you do primarily print, what have you been putting out that if people Google you, they'll be like, okay, all right, that makes sense coming from them. And that could be as a documentary, a, a docu-series, a format, a social experiment. You can play in all of those worlds, but the meat of what you're taking to market should be reflective of what everybody has already spent years cultivating in terms of reputation. So I like that idea. So start with you. And in a way, they're going to, in the creation process, someone should understand that it's believable it came from you. You have an expertise yes. or knowledge of it. So in the uh, exploration of the idea or the exploiting of the idea, whichever one it is, you should have some understanding of where it's coming from. And I'm gonna guess, be able to perpetually create that idea because it's part of who you are. If you're making yeah. something that's not you, you can make one good episode, but you can't make 40 years of Simpsons unless it comes from inside of you, you know? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. All right, so I like that idea. Start, start, from, start with yourself, know who you are. Um, but do you have to have, 
done something in the past in order to pitch an idea? No, no. Um, to to get it across the finish line of the buyer, somebody involved will likely need to have that because relationships, um, agency connections, your attorney, like it, it. I think it's going to be very hard in today's market for you know Tammy and Delaware to just roll up in LA and sell a series. But Tammy in Delaware might need somebody at cocktails and she has a great idea um, talking about Neil Berkeley. He and I are working with a first time director on something who, to my knowledge, has zero credits whatsoever. It's going to be a bit of an uphill battle, but he's done his work and he's he's somebody we believe in and we're both willing to put our reputation and credibility on the line. Will it sell? I have no idea. Is it a project buyers will have to really stop and consider because it is in the spirit of other shows and um, series that are out there, but it in, a, it in and of itself is not, and there's sort of parallel tracks, a very relevant story going on. Yeah, so I, I, I don't think you have to have a track record in unscripted TV to sell TV, otherwise no new voices would get heard. So then what do you need when it comes to, after the idea stage, what do you need to have in place in order to start having a real conversation of, about making the show? So uh, jokingly, but honestly, a leprechaun. Um, it, it, there's totally so leprechaun. many people out there doing what I do, what we do, who are just great. There's We're all competing for the same hours, and thank God for streaming, because you no longer have to think about it linearly in terms of three hours of prime time they're looking for programming for. But it is, it is luck, because it's very competitive out there. It's speed to market. Um, it happens several times a year where something I'm working on or have worked on in the past sells. And it's a shame when it's something I am currently working on and it beats me to market. But you need to know your project inside and out. It needs to be a bulletproof pitch. And that comes to the development process, being collaborative, loving your project, but not being in love with your project, loving it to the point where you're going to work on it, you're going to collaborate with others, you're going to hear the voices around you and say yes and and try to make it better, but don't be so in love with it that you are going to be rigid and that, no, that was my idea and not really willing to change it. My pitches change in the room when I'm pitching it. I I've seen I so it. many things and with exactly that problem. The person had this, you know, this really great idea. They're totally in love with it. And we say, oh, that's a really good idea. Could you change the hostess? Oh, no, no, this hostess is and like, well, then like, okay, that hostess only works for this one small demographic on the planet when the overall concept idea could be almost a format play around the whole world. If you can just yeah. let go of it and people will, they destroy their own project just that one, just with the, that one simple idea too, too much in love with it and not loving it and loving yeah. the process and loving the collaboration it takes to actually get it on air. That's, you just said it, loving the process. It's a bitch. It sucks. It is stressful because it is, you'll hit roadblocks and walls and then you think you're in love and then somebody points out a note and you're like, damn it, they're, they're right. But you gotta trust and love the process. So at the end of it, I've never had an idea that wasn't made better through the input of others. And it's frustrating as hell when somebody challenges my idea and I, it's somewhere between ego and laziness where I'm like, no, no, I'm right. But they're right. A lot of the time, other people are right. You're so close to your own work. So collaborative voices, loving and trusting the process. Um, I have a very rudimentary system in my new idea meetings where we're just ideating from scratch. Where every idea, my philosophy, every idea is a good idea. I'm not going to crap on your idea because I don't understand what it is. You shouldn't be, it's a new idea meeting. You shouldn't have all the answers, just a notion. So we whiteboard it all. We put everything on the whiteboard. And then at the end of the day, and this could be a two hour day, it could be a 10 hour day. There's no rules in, in my new ideas meeting in terms of duration. We go back and we do a check, check plus and check minus. Just Let's just see where we are after these 30 ideas got vomited out, 10 ideas, two ideas. What do we like? What do we love? What are we not so sure about? And even then we don't run with the check pluses. Now we all sleep on it. Tomorrow we're gonna come back. We're gonna look at this and see are the check pluses still check pluses? Sure. Were we just caught up in the moment? So easy to get caught up in the moment. And God, I love it when buyers get caught up in the moment of a pitch because they don't ask too many questions. Yeah. But, um, you know, Development takes time. 
development takes and, time. You know, and to the whiteboard idea too. I've I've worked with clients where you have that great idea, you prioritize them, and then you add one more column to that of like you will say like market or budget or yeah. you know, resources, and then all of a sudden it might be your favorite idea today, but the probability of that idea is really low with one more column on there. So you have to keep on expanding that and be willing to shift and change and move those priorities. Well, you, you just nailed kind of the next step. Once we've identified our check pluses and there's, I'm just making this up, there's six of them. Well, gosh, it's too much bandwidth for us to really do all of them simultaneously. Who are the buyers? Best case scenario. We have no idea what this show is ultimately going to be. Best case scenario from what we think it's going to be, who are the buyers going to be? We list those out and it's like, wow, that check plus has 12 buyers. That check plus has four buyers. We're working on the 12 first. Absolutely. And, and it and might not so, be your favorite idea, but it's the one that's most likely to close. That's exactly right. Now, it, it, it might not be your favorite of your favorites, remember, because these are all the check pluses. So it is, in fact, one of your favorites, just your least favorite of the most favorites, but it's still, it's your child. You sure. still love it. Um, but I'll, so, I'll say this too, like you have to, you have to build on credibility. Like it really, a, a win, a small win is going in the right direction opposed to waiting for the one big win with the one huge idea and then never really launching because there's too many barriers in the way. So yeah, it might not be the favorite of the favor them moment or the highest priority of the moment, but if it can get there, well, then you're one step closer to taking that one idea that you want to have and getting it out there as well. Exactly. And then, and then when it comes to, and then you, sorry, going back to your question, what do you need other than all these kind of notions, what do you need in hand? You don't need anything. What's helpful. Think about what you're selling. If you have a game show, it's very helpful to actually have the executives become the contestant, whether it's in the room or over zoom, have them play it. So figure out a way to engage them give them an experience to play the game, a better understanding of what the story is for the contestants. They look at the materials later, they can put back their executive hat. So game shows, formats, social experiments, they can play it, play it. If you're selling a, a, a documentary, a very tight tape and sizzle reels and sales tapes and proof of concepts and rip -a are all different things that are really sort of the same thing, just different. They're all appetizers, different dishes. Um, for a documentary, it can be a little bit longer, three and a half to six minutes if it moves, if it draws them in in the way that you're hoping the documentary is going to. Different from a docu-series, uh, which you're hoping will be ongoing for 10 seasons. But you're um, hitting on something that I find is a huge mistake that people make. They have the theory, if you build it, they will come. So they want to produce it first. They basically want to spend all the time, budget and money, $100,000, get that sucker in the can, make one big episode, and then try to sell their whole idea off of one episode. Don't do that. Missing Don't. It, that entire, yeah, the entire process of all the changes and all those little idiosyncrasies, you can't, once you've spent the money that you, you are locked in, you're, you've basically locked into concrete. When if you, you have $100,000 to spend on a project, there are nine to 10 other projects you're leaving on the cutting room floor. You should not be spending $100,000 totally right. on a project. And not to mention some Hire some me for 80,000 yeah. and you've already made a saving. No, you, just, you, can get you don't have to, to spend make, money uh, to make money. Yeah. That is a misnomer in our industry. You have to spend time and sweat equity to make money. You have to sit on your couch and watch TV to get a, a, an understanding of what the networks are doing in real time. You, it, it's, you have to, if you don't have time for that, you have to bring somebody in who does understand it. You need a Sherpa to, to help navigate this world for you um, and help you understand of your 13 ideas or your one idea, why is it coming from you? Who are the buyers for it? How is it going to be a, a solution to a problem a network is having in terms of losing eyeballs, retaining eyeballs, um launching their new digital platform the why behind content is something i've found in the last couple of years so few production companies consider well why uh, because i like it my wife said it was good yeah we spent a hundred thousand on this tape dude yeah. i can't i can't tell you how many times it's like the tape shows up and i'm like wow okay so the first problem we have is can you get over the loss of whatever ninety thousand dollars you spent that's gonna be thrown away when we get done with this thing well and, and let me talk about the economics of unscripted for a second 
the economics don't look great in a first season. A lot of the time you, you will be a break even business in season one or pretty close to it because you want to put as much onto the screen as you can to get that second season. And then, and then it's a snowball as you get more and more seasons. Yes, economics are great. But if you are already going that much into the red just to get it sold, it's, and you're fortunate enough to have several ideas. That's a lot of red that you're going to have to dig yourself out of. So, uh, yeah, you just probably, I mean, we should just tell people we're only beginning the conversation with you because from just what you said right there alone, I have three more questions and we're here for another two hours to get the answers. And we're not even going down the simple path I was trying to keep because we can go off on tangents that we've done. Um, but you know, the, so I'll say we should tell everyone we're going to put together a pitch day, a show launcher pitch day. We're going to do it as we did before, kind of have like a small conference, talk about all these ideas, take people's pitches, get them in the room and process. It's a big workshop day. And at the end of the day, there will be actual people to pitch to. So you actually get your, your face in front of some executives. And if nothing better, you got some great feedback on your idea, but hopefully there's some ideas going there. So that's just a little plug of where we're going to go with some of this stuff. Um, but I do want to come back to this thought of like, um, how do I actually get into the room then? Like, I think people are afraid and they want to be legitimate. So they spend the money or they've done all this extra work to just be ready for the room because they're nervous or they're worried. And what you and I both know is like on the other side of that door is a really simple conversation. It's a, it's a pitch. You're talking about it. It's yeah. a process uh, still once you get to the other side. So um, just before we jump off, give us like one kind of last idea of like, if I have an idea, where do I start with a conversation of how do I get in the room with somebody to start having that conversation? I guess it, see, you just opened up two hour conversation. I know, I, <laughs> it's so hard to, to do this, isn't it? it? <laughs> again, every, every company, every person and every project is different. If you have, if you want to be the uh, production services company, I would answer one thing. If you're willing to hand that off to establish a, a track record as a creative and you also have the production means for the next one, I would say partner with a production company that makes sense. If it is a docu-series, who are the people that are selling docu-series to the networks so you think that's right? Reach out to them either through so their agent. Just a real, real quick cliff note on what you're saying then is like your first pitch might be to a production company. Yeah, your department. first pitch, I would recommend your first pitch not ever be to a network. Even yeah. if you have no intention of partnering with the production company, you need to kick the tires. You need to I go use... out there and process with people that could possibly be collaborators with you. And your first pitches are, do you want to work with me? Do you want to work with me? Do you want to work with me? And then that team is what kind of moves the momentum forward. Yeah, let your great idea latch on to the reputation of somebody else to get it into that room. And, and whether, here's the two hours condensed in a sentence, whether it is that production company or agent or attorney, whoever's getting you in the room, or on the other side, I have a great project for X and I happen to know X is a passion area for celebrity Y. Let me target that celebrity and attach them to this, maybe they have a production company, maybe it's a production company and vanity only, and it's just a logo and nothing else. But now all of a sudden, everybody wants to be in business with Beyonce and look, we got her. So that's right. Uh, you know, th there are a lot of ways to get in every project, every company, every idea calls for a different solution. Um, it like is a little tough for me to think pointedly if you don't have the ins just because I've been around for so long now if there's a network I don't have a relationship because there are new ones emerging every day um I know I, I'm a phone call away from somebody who can make that intro and it's usually my agent <laughs> so. yeah and one one more encouragement um and you can back me up on this too is if you want to be successful you can also change your scorecard so if if what you think the level of success is is making a 12 part miniseries on HBO that's fully funded by some corporate brand or whatever, that's a really high scorecard to keep. But what you're trying to do is make content that people consume and change the world through it. A YouTube, a constant YouTube feed from just from your own desk is a possibility of success. Now, now there's a lot of layers between it. And if you want to do something, if you want to make a living doing this, you're up, up against something different than if you're going to use, do this as a hobby and to understand your own scorecard so that you can pursue that success the right way 
that also yeah. allows for some freedom. And again, we'll say again, that collaboration, that process, you're more open to that process because you're trying to achieve something bigger. Well, it, it goes back to how we started this, which is look inward. Why is it coming from you? And be honest with yourself. What is your measure of success? So if you're trying to keep up with the Joneses, you're going to be a failure. I can't tell you that it happened today. I opened up deadline. I saw somebody about something about somebody I don't particularly care for excelling. And I'm like, ah, I, why isn't that me? Run your own race. Be honest with yourself. If selling into development to me is just as valid as selling into season two, you're in the game. That's what you want. And I'll, 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 I don't know how much time we have, so I'll just say I'll end on this, but we'll keep yeah. going. To me, a successful pitch does not necessarily have to sell the project you are pitching. It has to sell you because you are somebody that either through your own ideas, the ideas of those around you, you're not a one and done person. If you are, you wouldn't be doing this. That's so as long as your pitch sells you, so the buyer's like, that's not right, but Jesus, I've never heard that take on that before. Can't wait to see what she has next. That's, that's a win. That's a very, very successful pitch because I think the buyer's sitting on the other side of the table, want every pitch. They don't want to waste their time. They're praying you walk in. You're like, give me an Emmy. Give me the Super Bowl ratings. Oh, no. So when you <laughs> do come in and like, all right, you know what? They didn't give me the Emmy, but their brain, their visuals, their je ne sais quoi, it brings something that is interesting and dynamic that I want to hear more of. That can be a successful pitch. So even if they pass, and they will, they'll pass a lot, as long as it's selling you and your capabilities, it is a win. And don't beat yourself up over the losses. Selling the next pitch and the next pitch. Sell the, the, next sell the career. Sell the narrative. And Easier then even said than someone done. pitching to you, someone when you're the recipient of a pitch, is also a benefit when you have that momentum moving forward. Because your mind is open up, you're hearing it, and you might make a connection where someone else would be, quote unquote, successful. But the exactly. reality of your connection and your ability to put those pieces together, that's what we're all banking on, right? And, I, and again, like I, I believe most of us who are in this business know what it's like to pitch. We do that with our clients. We know what it's like to deliver. We know what it's like to collaborate. We know what it's like to create that momentum, to get the work out the door. We do it all the time. And then for some reason, when we cross over to this space, we imagine it's totally different than what we do every day, which is right. wake up and this is what you do for a living. And you think about it and you pitch it and you move it forward. Um, all right. There's let's just say like, we're going to, this is chapter one. Maybe this is just a pre prelude to something. Um, there's a, there's so much more. And, and really, I'll just say, I, it's great to be collaborating with you and, and thanks to Neil for making this happen because the conversations that we've had, I'm totally loving them. And I just wanted to steal you away from the private conversations and put you out in front of everyone so that they get some of this, uh, this a great insights that you have. So I appreciate you being willing to do this for us. I look, if there's anything I love, it's more than creative. It's just talking about creative to other creative. So I love this. Thanks for having me. Yeah, sure. If, uh, if people are interested, you can, you're on community, you can just reach out to me. Um, I think Saul might be on community. If not, he's going to be on it pretty soon. So we can uh, create some direct messages with him as well. Um, let's just start the conversation. And, and as we said, we're already talking about doing another pitch day and, and right after the summer's up so we can create a day there. And if interested, we might be able to do some smaller stuff together too. So uh, thank good. you Saul very much. And thank you all for watching the weekly briefing. Um, please, you know, feel free to hit us up on the community.revthink.com and we'll see you there. Later Thanks, Saul, Thanks. have a good one. Thanks everybody.